It's 7.30 on a Wednesday night, and Trooper Tim Cronin is patrolling Palmer's slippery streets when he gets a call about a suspected drunk driver going the wrong direction. And he's refusing to stop for troopers. So we were just told to expedite, so we're going to get there quickly. Just pull the light, come on. Dispatch runs the vehicle's plates and reveals some troubling info on the driver. Ten four. Trooper Cronin takes up position at a nearby cutoff. We're gonna try and take him by surprise, see if we can get him cornered. Twenty forty three. What's your twenty now? Passing Bonaparte. We're still going. Uh oh. The suspect's driving well under the speed limit, but he still won't pull over. Now come on, before three vehicles occupied by two males. Speed 20. I'm going to be in behind 28. But the low speeds don't make the pursuit any less dangerous. It's going to be pretty hard to get him unless we kind of corner him on the roadway. But the roads are icy. This is extremely dangerous. Even with three trooper vehicles behind him, the driver still refuses to pull over. Passing under loss. Thank over at Lumber Loss. And we're stopping at Lumber Loss. Nice and slow, nice and slow. Tell him to turn it off. Turn the, off. turn the vehicle off. Turn off the car. Turn the vehicle off. Put your hands. Put your hands on the dash. Hands on the dash. I'm just gonna take a call you need, okay? Go ahead and step out. I don't have a gun. Didn't you say it was in your coveralls? I said I had a knife. Uh, just turn it, turn it just a little bit and I'm gonna take that knife, okay? Okay. Right Passengers, just, just stay put right there, alright? You almost hit me head on as you were coming southbound on Vine here, and you ran like three or four cars off the road. Troopers suspect there's more to the man's story. So I can smell some alcohol coming off your breath. You got some bloodshot water, guys. How much have you had to drink tonight? <laughs> Highway Patrol Trooper John Ostage arrives on scene to administer field sobriety tests. I can't do what you're asking me to do. Okay. With a steel plate in his right foot, uh -huh. I can't do that. Okay. It won't work that way. Okay. It won't work to walk? No, it won't work to walk. I fall down and break my damn hip. Is that safe for you to drive, Dave? I thought I was safe to drive. So That's what I'm going to do. Give me a sample of your pressure a little bit. Well, I'm going to tell you right now that I'm not going to do that. You cannot calibrate those. Those are illegal. That's been calibrated. That got calibrated no. just this summer. I had the no. certificate to prove it. In the lower 48, in the lower 48, right, listen to me. Those, okay. those, right, those are not. They're, they're, You're going to put some of rest for DUI. See, this is why I hate to drive at night. Look at these idiots. Troopers safely guide the man to jail and leave the passenger with a vehicle to wait for a sober driver. They'll hold the driver on a $500 bond. He could face a minimum $1,500 fine, 90 days suspended license, and three days behind bars. I mean, we've got enough driving issues with it, just snowing and the stuff on the road as it is. We don't need someone who's uh, extremely impaired driving down the road in the wrong lane late at night. Now, what am I supposed to do? This he had the potential to definitely hurt someone, but thankfully, we got behind him with all our lights on before that could happen, so we're pretty happy. Crisis averted on the streets of Palmer. But across the valley... Mac, I'm only 35. Trooper Eric Taylor is investigating a brazen nighttime theft. Last night, Articat dealership in Big Lake had an ATV stolen. They pulled the gate open with a four-wheeler and drove this machine out. It's about a $15,000 machine. We've got three troops working it now. Once we show up on scene, we'll start processing tire tracks, shoe impressions, collect the video that they have. Then we'll try to start locating this machine. Whoever stole the vehicle chose the wrong time.
Trooper Taylor is part of a brand new division called the Criminal Suppression Unit, created to deal with just this type of crime. We're basically a property crimes unit, uh, theft, burglaries, high dollar criminal mischiefs, arsons, vehicle thefts, uh, stuff like that. Beforehand, as a patrol trooper, you take so many calls that if you have a theft, you basically go do an interview. Uh, process the scene and then try to do follow-up as you can. You don't get to focus your time on that. Uh, now, you know, something like this comes in, we get to focus on it until the case is solved. First day, we recovered an ATM that was stolen and put two guys in jail. Day two, we recovered a stolen vehicle and that guy's in jail, so it's productive. And it's only going to get better. I can be 35 and 50, 10, 6, weekly guard account. Taylor arrives to find Trooper Granda already on scene. Looks like there was two people. Okay. They uh, went up to their snow machine, they climbed the fence, lowered the uh, barbed wire, jumped over, and broke through that fence. We've got a couple of quick impressions that we found. Okay. Yeah. These are some good ones. They've marked the tracks for analysis with orange paint. Fortunately for troopers, this isn't your average ATV. Things got some big tires on it. It'll be easy to recognize. This is some of them right here. Got a photo of it. Oh, it's a quad, huh? Yeah, it's a quad. How big is it? 1,000. Mud what? Mud Pro. Mud Pro? 1,000 Mud Pro. It's like a $15,000 machine, so... Uh, supposedly, there are only eight of them in the state. And then, I got video. Okay. All right. Video from the owner's security camera reveals the perpetrator's bold tack. They're about to ram it. But unfortunately for troopers, little else. It's not definitive of who it was. They're not that big. You can see the head back to the hockey rink back here, mm -hmm. and then that's where we went back earlier. It's okay. Let's go find it. Let's do this. Troopers head back to the hockey rink behind the dealership. So this might be a good lead. And pick up the stolen ATV's tracks. Mac on 35 is all 50. They were all over down here. Here, crosses right over. They came down to the end and turned around. Yep, they head back out. So maybe they went straight. Let's go see. All the tracks are all over the place, down all the roads. It almost sounds like they were you now joyriding with this thing. Right now they've got a, you know, 14, 15 hour lead on us. Uh, the thing could be, I think it'd be anywhere right now. If it takes us all shift, we'll take all shift to locate this ATV. It's not long before troopers receive a new lead. 1549, A nearby resident claims to have seen the joyriders in the act. She said they saw four individuals on snow machine last night. She said they had been drinking. They stopped in and did a couple of laps around their house and then took off. And she said they saw the ATV or an ATV, one of the individuals worked next door to the Articat shop. So we're gonna go contact them. So this might be a good lead. Hey, what's up, man? How you doing? Where's that? Uh, he's home. Did you happen to be with him last night by any chance? No. Okay. Oh, yeah, I was out riding. Right? Oh, you were out riding? Right? Can I speak to you inside there for sure. just a little bit? Of Upon further questioning, the man states he split off with a suspect before the time of the theft. He points the troopers towards the suspect's location, who he claims was out later in the night. Back on the gun, 1943, the 1943 Big Lake, reference to the stolen machine. 10-4. So, he was complaining about losing some bright gloves that he had just bought. 10-4. Let's just go see. Troopers find him waiting outside of his house. Okay, put your hands out of your overall, so you know what we're here for. If you could just keep your hands out of your pocket for a while, talk to you. Back in the field, 1943, the 1019 Big Lake, reference to the stolen fishing. Troopers are hot on the trail of the stolen ATV after receiving a tip from a nearby resident. She said they saw four individuals on snow machine, did a couple of laps around their house, and she said they saw the ATV, or an ATV, and then took off down the trails. So this might be a good lead. Let's just go see. Okay, put your hands out of your overalls. If you can just keep your hands out of your pockets for a while, I'm talking to you. So you know what we're here for. 
After questioning, both the suspect and his wife admit to being out riding at the time of the theft. But they both claim to have no knowledge of the stolen ATV. Uh. And troopers don't have enough to charge the couple. Basically, everyone at the house we interviewed, um, you know, their time frames were off. We talked to his wife, her time frames are, you know, two to three hours off from his mother and daughter's story where they felt rehearsed. That's our prime suspect now. But they're no closer to finding the stolen ATV. Then dispatch forwards Taylor a surprise call. You're going to need a full drive to get there. It's just deep snow and hard to drive. It's back to the tree. While collecting firewood, a concerned citizen has found an abandoned ATV. About a quarter mile back on a snow machine trail, off about 100 yards. Okay, you want to meet me at the, right there at the dump? Okay, I'll see you there. All right, thanks. Let's roll. Are you yes, sir. All right. <laughs> I was down here getting wood. Okay. Right down here in the corner. I noticed a brand new 1,000. Mud, mud pro. That's what we're looking for. Party cat stuck back in the trees, and somebody broke a couple of branches, trying to lean up against it. Looked like they were trying to stash it. Okay, yeah. Can so, you show us where it goes off the roadway, and then we'll follow in from there? Okay. Kind of odd to see a brand new. Yeah. Is that it right there? You gotta get out of here. Yeah, right there. It just kind of thrashed out through there. Yeah. Deep in the woods, they discover the dented and frozen wreck. Over the years, that's pretty evident they didn't know what the hell they were doing. Take the rashes thing, dude. Yeah, they did. That's it. Trooper Taylor carefully documents the scene and uncovers key material evidence. There's some fibers on the handlebars. You can see where they hit everything. Uh, I think they were trying to hide it and come back later and pick it up. The dealership owners arrive on scene. Is it still warm? Is um, it still warm? No, it's ice over. The whole thing's ice over. And despite the likely thousands in damages, are overjoyed to have their property back. Thank you so much. Well, yeah, let me get the DNA stuff and we'll get this out. Thank you. Less than 12 hours after the crime, the trooper's newly formed criminal suppression unit has returned this $15,000 vehicle to its rightful owner. Now they'll follow this solid trail of evidence to the very end. We get to focus on it until the case is solved, so, you know, maybe we can put them in jail. But the owner's got the ATV back and... He's happy, so it's very rewarding. 200 miles south, in Soldatna, a different kind of suspect is on the loose. Wildlife trooper Maggie Stang is heading out in search of a reported illegal fur trapper. Today, we're going to go check a mink set. Season closed January 31st, and it's now February 2nd. We got a tip yesterday saying that this guy's got his set out, so we're going to go see if we can make contact with the trapper. He's two days over. But trapping a trapper isn't easy. It's kind of looking for a needle in a haystack, but maybe we'll get lucky and see him actually in the field to be able to make a case. Once the lifeblood of Alaskan trade, fur trapping has become more of a pastime outside the most remote communities. But with renewed demand from China, fur prices are soaring up to $100 for a single mink pelt. And it's up to the troopers to ensure a sustainable harvest. It's a mandatory court appearance, taking fur-bearing animals closed season. There's a monetary fee that goes along with it, and a lot of that is just to discourage people from making that kind of a decision. But on the unmarked back roads, the informant's directions prove difficult to follow. There's a red picnic table. There's a pile of rocks. So pay attention for a pile of rocks and a red picnic table. And I have a feeling that snow machine trail might have been it. He said it's hanging right out over the river bank. She's on the right track. The red, the red picnic table. But finding the traps themselves on the icy riverbanks won't be easy. So, it's a wooden box, um, and then the trap will be mounted to the front. Typically, they're not marked very well for people. Sometimes they'll be um, like surveyor's tape ribbon on it. That's in case we get a heavy snowfall or so the trapper can actually find his line again. But most of the time, you know, you don't really want to broadcast your trap. It was right in front of a wood house, so we're getting fairly close. There it is. <laughs> and it's currently occupied. The mink's right there. It looks like he was using 
fish heads. You're not allowed to use any edible part of the fish. That looks like a, a real hook nose. See, it's tied off. So even if, let's say, it was caught in the foot and, you know, it had three other feet to try to run off with, it's anchored down. So it's not going anywhere. The frozen specimen's been dead for days. It's surprising a raven hasn't gotten into it. You know, it's a tasty little treat. But this is absolutely wasteful. But there's no sign of the trap's owner. Building a trapping case is a little frustrating. You can leave it and set up a game cam and hopefully catch, you know, the guy coming. That's kind of a long shot. So I'm going to go up and talk to the landowner and see if they have any information about it. But property owners in Alaska don't always welcome visitors. Hello! Hello! Good morning! Stang approaches with caution. Going on tape 1115. Oh, yeah, come out with a gun. Good morning. Hey, what's this? Good morning. Hey, what's this? <laughs> I'm Trooper Stang with the Wildlife Troopers. Um, hey, 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 get back, get back. Get back. Get back. I just have a quick couple questions about a trap down below. Do you know anything about that one? About what down below? A trap? Yeah, right up front, it's mine. Oh, is it? Yeah. Okay. Um, what are you We're trapping? Not no, you're not. Oh, me. Okay. The man unexpectedly admits he's been trapping mink out of season. So, do you have any other sets out? I got one other one down by where the tree's broken off. Okay. And then how? Can I show you? Sure. Let me grab that. So, do you know when mink closes? Mink closes, I think it's the 15th. No. 31st of January. Oh, really? Oh. I was awfully sure it was the 15th. He leads wildlife trooper Stang back to the trap. Oh where he discovers his illegal catch. You're going to take this one, though. I don't get this one. No, you don't. 31st at midnight, it becomes mine. So, John, where's the other one? It's on the corner. Here's the other one. And this one's for mink as well, yeah? Yeah. Okay. Empty, but still illegal. The extended links because of all that warm weather until the 15th, but they not mink. Trooper Stang seizes the mink and the trap that killed it. Look at the size, it's a good size. Oh yeah, it's a beauty. But she lets him keep his other trap, as long as he takes it down. He was very open and honest. Um, a lot of the times you don't get that. My bad, my bad. If they know a ticket's coming, and in this case, that guy knew a ticket was coming, you know, it didn't change his demeanor at all. He still wanted to talk, he still he still wanted to be forthright and, and come out with the information. I mean, I screwed up here, you know, I didn't, I guess I wasn't thinking. Stang issues the man a ticket for trapping out of season which requires a court appearance and a minimum $500 fine. Could have been a whole lot worse, right? Could it? Yeah, you could have had another one, and I'd take both. And I'd have got two tickets? <laughs> <laughs> you guys don't have women like this down there. Alaskan women, they go out and they'll kick your butt. I'd say, you better not have it stuffed and put in your window. Oh, come on. <laughs> and troopers will make sure this illegal kill doesn't go to waste. I'm going to keep it as evidence for a little while, figure out where the case is going, and then um, ultimately we'll turn it over to ADF and G, and then they can do education with it. They've got, they've got a whole onslaught of things that they do with things like that. <laughs> I'll see y'all. See y'all. Take care. While the sun shines on wildlife troopers in Soldatna, back north in Fairbanks, temperatures are plummeting. Excuse me. Fairbanks 35, maybe 1019 to Fouts. And Trooper Mike Munson responds to a call that's threatening to boil over. So the call we received was from a landowner. She had received a threat from a tenant earlier saying the next time he saw her, she couldn't be sure what would happen. He's now parked in a driveway. He's been sitting there for a few minutes. She's afraid that he might come and try and do something to her. So she's hiding in her house. He could have a gun and a scar. He could be any number of things. It could have stemmed from something as simple as he's late on his rent. She wants him to pay it. He doesn't want to. We're not sure exactly what's the motivation, but the fact that he's sitting in her driveway has already threatened, essentially, to cause her harm gives us a lot of worry that he may be willing to make good on his promise. We're going to turn our lights off so that we can um, hopefully come across him without alerting him. There's a lot of places he could go. Should be the next street near where those headlights are. Let me see your hands! Hey, sir. My name is Trooper Munson, the State Troopers. What you doing out here? Uh, 
just waiting for her to get my mail. Did you call her on the phone today and say, hey, I want to come pick up my mail? How'd this happen? I, well, uh, I was uh, notified that I had mail today because I've been waiting on the package. Mm -hmm. So I know it's here. Okay. Well, here's the, here's the thing. Uh, why do you think we got called today? I mean, why do you think I'm here? She's been trying to call the cops on me if I come here. I'm not on her property right now. Why did she have to say that uh, she called the cops if you came by? Because she thinks I owe her money for my stuff being in my old room. That doesn't make a reason to call the cops, though. Well, I'm going to go talk to her and uh, see what she has to say about it. And I just want to make sure that everything you tell me is the truth. Because the last thing I want to do is get you all hemmed up in a lie, because you know how that goes. It just rolls downhill. Everything's good to go, what you said so far? Yep. Okay. Well, I'm going to go talk to her real quick, okay? All right. State troopers. Hi. Hey, ma'am. Okay. So what's uh, what's the story with him? Well, he ran it from me for a while. Then we started seeing a bunch of stuff missing, so I asked him to leave. Mm -hmm. So he moved, which was great. I mean, like, the next week he moved. Gotcha. So he's, he did get mail here. Mm -hmm. How he knew that it was here, I don't know, but it came today. Mm -hmm. And so I was just going to mark on it, return to sender, not at this address anymore, and send it back. And then he started texting me this afternoon before I got home from work, mm -hmm. telling me that he was coming to get his mail. And I said, you're not welcome on my property. Is this his mail here? Yes. I said, you're not welcome on my property anymore. Don't come on my property. And he totally lost it. He has an anger issue. And so he started cussing and screaming and calling me everything in the book. And then he said, um, I, you forget that I'm military. You have no idea what I can do to you. I said, you're not welcome on my property anymore. Don't come on my property. And he totally lost it. And then he said, um, you forget that I'm military. You have no idea what I can do to you. Did he say that on the phone or was it via text? On the phone. Okay. Twice he said that to me. And I didn't even know he was here because there's no windows on this side of the house, so I, I couldn't see out there. So does he still have property in here? Yep. He's got a couple of bags and he's got his golf clubs. Okay. Here's what I want to talk to you about. Let me preface this by saying I spent a lot of years in the military, okay, 15 years active duty, so I don't take lightly to people abusing their military position. She's telling me that you made some comments saying that you're in the military and she doesn't know what you're capable of. Okay, so true to that? No. But why, why is she in there crying, scared out of her wits, telling me that you said this twice today on the telephone if it didn't happen? I, I'm, not, I, yeah. I'm just saying I hope it didn't happen that way, okay? So here's what's going to happen. She's got your property inside. We're going to go in there and get it. I'll help you move it out. And then once you move out, she doesn't want you coming back. Yeah, you, re you can go inside and get your stuff? Yeah, okay. Should just be one more trip, ma'am. Definitely a classic. He said, she said there were some critical elements that they both disagreed on. We're able to just kind of get everyone uh, going in their separate directions, concluding with a trespass so he knows that if he does come back for any reason, he's going to go to jail. If you did say those things before, then I ask that you don't do it again, okay? Make sure you keep a positive light in the eye of what the military does, you got it? Okay. Take care, you can't come back. You officially been trespassed, okay? I'll do that. All right. Drive safe. 850 miles away in the remote port city of Ketchikan. Ketchikan, when I mentioned all units are 1023. Trooper Joey Bowden is trying to stop the spread of a bad influence. Ketchikan's a place that gets every other drug from the lower 48. A lot of it comes in on a ferry. A lot of time we have contact with people and sees uh, large quantities of drugs. And Bowden must get creative to sniff it out. There's a lot of side roads in Ketchikan, a lot of secluded places where people will go down at nighttime and hang out. Not long into his patrol, he spots a suspicious parked car. Ketchikan, let me know. I'll be out with the vehicle, Connor Lake. Yeah, Very secluded out there. No reason why people should be hanging out there that late at night. How you doing? Everything okay? Yeah, cool. Okay. You don't ever see anyone down here, so... Yeah, we're just up here, chilling. Is this your vehicle? Yeah. You guys have your IDs on here real quick? Yeah. Hi, uh, Mr. Do you have a driver's license or just this uh, military ID? I just have that military ID. She was driving. I just... Oh, you're the one who drove in here, though. I, I drove from up there to down here. All right. So do you have a valid license? I don't. Any reason why you're driving if you don't have a valid license? I just bought it, and mm -hmm. I wanted to take it for a quick spin. You guys meeting anyone up here or anything? Or? No, I have to go home out north. We figured we'd come up here and talk a little bit. Okay, you guys see anyone else up here? No, I haven't so far. I haven't okay. seen anybody yet. Okay, why don't you just take a seat, Mr. Okay? Sure. Just a suspicious, it's a secluded road. There's no buildings or anything down here. He was completely turning around, reaching behind the back seats. It's not knowing if there's weapons inside the car, what he's doing. It appeared he was hiding something. It looked like he was trying to cover something with his coat. 
19, 10, 4, 27, 29 times 2. The driver's on conditions of release for drug charges. Do me a favor. I don't know what's in your vehicle, okay? Can you not uh, reach around like that? Oh, yeah, okay. Okay. I don't know what's in your car, so I don't like people just reaching around there, okay? I'm going to put some handcuffs on you real quick, okay? Because you're violating conditions of release by driving, okay? Stand up. Go ahead and place your hands on your back. With the driver in cuffs, Bowden presses for more info. Inside the vehicle, you're moving around a lot. It's suspicion that you're probably hiding something in the back seat. Looks like you're pulling a coat over everything. This is where you want to be honest, okay? What were you hiding back there? I was grabbing some cigarettes. Just cigarettes? Okay. And is there any weapons or drugs inside the car? No? Do you have an issue if I search the vehicle for drugs? Well, it's... I mean, I've had some people in my car today. Is it possible that they might have left something in there? There should not be anything in my car. Though. Okay. Do you mind if I check? There's no drugs in my car. Okay. All right, if I search the vehicle? Yes. 1904, I'll be doing consent search of vehicle. None of this property is yours? No, sir. Okay, all the bags and all that, not yours? No. Okay. What are those used for? 1904, I'll be doing consent search of vehicle. Inside the jacket, what she was fumbling with when I contacted them were three used syringes and a strip of Suboxone. Suboxone is a prescription painkiller commonly used to treat opiate addiction. It suppresses withdrawal from drugs like heroin and morphine, but can also be abused. Okay, are you prescribed Suboxone? No, I'm not. Okay, is that what you're hiding in the back there? Yes. That looks like... Suboxone that you put in your mouth and it dissolves. So what are the syringes they look used? What are those used for? That's how I do my suboxone. That's how you do your suboxone? Okay, why do you do it that way? It just hits me faster, I guess. I don't know why. When was the last time you used the suboxone? Like two hours ago. Okay. Bowden lets the passenger go. Have somebody pick you up. Okay. And takes the driver to jail. His bail set at $4,500 based on violating conditions of release, having a controlled substance that he's not prescribed, and driving on a revoked license. Old school police work takes another drug offender off the streets. While back in Fairbanks, a couple's heated argument threatens to turn fatal. Unit's responding. Female is intoxicated. Complaint is advised. She's already fired the 45 caliber handgun once. Sounds like a uh, female that uh, we've dealt with before a shot a gun in the house. She has access to all the weapons in the red room. 12-gauge shotgun, 30-06, and 22-gauge uh, The fact that uh, she owns guns and obviously knows how to use them, things could uh, escalate really quick. The plan is advised that he believes the 30 06 is loaded. I mean, good cop to be nervous right now. So we're definitely going to prepare for the worst. Troopers check in with the woman's husband, who has fled from the residence. But suddenly, I just came on that bedroom. See it? There's movement inside. Let's get posted up. I want one person on that back right corner. Right? I call this one, two, three, four. Sergeant Interreden tries to make contact with the woman, while Trooper Lay secures the perimeter. It can be very dangerous. Are they drunk? What kind of weapon do they have? What would that firearm or weapon do to me? She might shoot through the walls of the house. You know, she might shoot through the door. He says he's inside now. 
Very just copy. I'm still in the back of the house. Right now, Sergeant uh, in a reading in contact with suspect here in the house. What's going on there? Temporary. I don't know what's going on. Troopers take the woman. 36, 10, 60, copy H traffic. I'll be moving forward. We took our time, and once when we made contact with her, uh, we saw that she didn't have any weapons or anything in her hand, and then we were able to de-escalate the situation and go from there. So it was a great success. No one was hurt, so it worked out well. For Trooper Lay, this is a call that hits all too close to home. A couple months ago, I was involved in a shooting incident. I've been doing this for about eight years now, and uh, that's probably one of the closest calls I've ever had. We put on this uniform every day, and you don't know if you're coming home. Everyone handles it differently, but... When you sign up to do this job, you uh, you have a task to complete, and you do what you have to do. Back south in the Matsu Valley. Is that three? Mix four, mix five. The trooper's new criminal suppression unit is protecting citizens from cold-hearted thieves. That two, four, three, two. And today, they're investigating a recently stolen snowmobile. We got a cut lock. Uh, they didn't break in. Do we know what time frame? Last 24 hours. And this isn't a new phenomenon for the neighborhood. So we've got uh, the same type of theft in the same area that we've been having recently. So we might want to check that address out in Houston since so much stolen stuff shows up there. Yep. Okay. In Alaska, snow machines are the primary mode of transportation for many locals during the winter. But many rural roads are icy and unreliable. For this victim, the vehicle was key to her family's survival. Where else can we check? Well, I would say... House. That's a pretty good bet. It is. We'll go back there, right? Sounds good. All right. They head to the scene of the crime to search for clues. Really, at this point, our ultimate goal is to get a snow machine back to its rightful owner. She lives in a, a very modest house, kind of off the grid, and she's, you know, raising three children. And her only mode of transportation to go back to the, the store and get bread, milk, and eggs is this snow machine. So, yeah, it's a big deal. Really, at this point, our ultimate goal is to get a snow machine back to its rightful owner. Troopers are on the hunt for a stolen snow machine. And for the victim, the vehicle is key to her family's survival. She lives in a, a very modest house, kind of off the grid, and she's, you know, raising three children. And her only mode of transportation to go back to the, the store and get bread, milk, and eggs is this snow machine. So, yeah, it's a big deal. But getting to the crime scene isn't easy. We're going right over there to... I'm going to drive out on the ice road right now. I'm always uh, trying to evaluate what the ice looks like. I mean, if I wasn't talking right now, I'd probably have my windows rolled down. Just in case uh, the unlikely event comes up that we do uh, take a little plunge through the ice. So it pretty much just looks like a normal road, but we are driving on an ice road. And to fall through the ice into the frigid 32-degree water can cause hypothermia in a matter of minutes. Safely on the other side, troopers arrive to find a cabin and property deserted but the crime scene is still fresh no this is right here there's the broken lock he was talking about yeah that just happened pretty recently and these thieves didn't bother to cover their tracks you got these tracks right here these are all pretty new uh these ones right here and you can tell they've got this little built-up snow berm right along here he's moving pretty good because he went airborne off that and he just went straight that way so now we have an area the size of Rhode Island to look for a single snow machine in. But thankfully, most criminals aren't all that smart, and uh, we have an idea of where this snow machine's going to end up. Troopers follow the thieves' track to a residence where they've recovered stolen goods before. We've been to this house a number of times. One of our local uh, near do wells down here in Houston. We're going to go pay them a visit. If the person that stole it isn't here, we'll follow up with them later, but I want to get this sled. And as we're driving up right now, I see we got fresh snow machine tracks leading into the street. They decide to sneak up on the residence in case the suspects try to hide the stolen sled. Yeah, I see it. Okay, go ahead. Trooper Taylor splits off to search the area next to the property while Sergeant Wigson heads to the house. Macam 11 in the driveway. No one 
Jones home. They're not answering the door. But Taylor spots something in the adjacent field. Yep, that's ours. Nice. Stolen snow machine park 20 feet from the house. It's funny that when stolen stuff comes up, I just take a trip over here and I find it. Um, one's a coincidence, two's a trend. I've been coming here for 11 years. Get this thing back to the owner. Exactly 48 hours after witnessing. Put this one in the wind column. Sergeant Wigson volunteers to return it to the owner himself. It's a pretty modest snow machine, but it's our only form of transportation. And so this is going to be huge for her. This is, this is her only means of getting around. She's already uh, on the phone. She's been pretty excited about getting her slept back. One, two, three. If you ask any cop, I don't care if they're an Alaska State Trooper or they work for uh, another PD down in America, uh, they're going to tell you one of the things that they want to be able to do is help people that can't help themselves. Can I come in? One snow machine return 48 hours later. Awesome. This is me and the girls' main source of transportation. We get generator gas, water, and everything with it. And You're welcome. This is one of the things I like to do, which is get good people back their stuff that they pay harder money for. Say thank you. You're very welcome. Have a good night. You too. All right. This is one of the things that we sign up to do. So today is a pretty big success. You're welcome. 